Hi, this is Paula from CHNE. Today we have the complete recording of the Eastern Planning Public Meeting that took place earlier this week in Shetty Camp. You will be able to listen to the whole meeting, but first, I wanted to give you some context and the takeaway from the meeting, in case you don't make it to the end of the recording. I don't know if you remember a story that we published in September about a new RV campground in Point Cross. Neighbors around the site had raised concerns about how the campground would impact the area. Since then, there has been an official request to change the bylaw. The changes would apply only to campgrounds and only to the Shedigam area. Here's the map. It would go from the edge of the National Park to about Grand Etat. South of that, saint joseph du moine is not included in this bylaw. The meeting was held by the Sherikam Area Advisory Committee, who wanted to consult the community before making recommendations to Municipal Council. Then there will be a public hearing where the community can provide feedback. After that, Council will vote on it. The last step is to get approval from the Minister. At the end of the meeting earlier this week, it was decided that there's going to be a moratorium on all new campgrounds for 150 days. So no new campgrounds will be allowed in the residential zone during that time. John Bain, director of the Eastern District Planning Commission, said it should be enough time to make a final decision on the zoning bylaw. Bain also said that what he's considering, after hearing from the community, is to create a special tourist commercial zone for campgrounds, and they would be removed from the current residential zone. If those changes are made, they would not apply to current campgrounds unless they stop operations for 12 months or more. If they do, they will have to comply to the new regulations. So here's the complete meeting. We're here from the District Planning Commission. Maybe what I'll do is um, just go around the table with, with introductions so everybody knows who's here and who's on the committee. This gentleman, Steve gentleman to my left. My name is Alf Morty, and uh, I'm the Deputy Warden Councillor for Shedekam and an Advisory Committee member. My name is John Vane. I'm the Director of the Eastern District Planning Commission. The Planning Commission is responsible for administering the, um, the uh, land use bylaw, the zoning bylaw for the Shenikam area. Uh, also, the building inspectors, the gentleman who's at uh, the ladies at the Trois Pignon, uh, once a week is one of my building inspectors. We do building inspection, zoning, and um, dangers and outside the premises. That kind of stuff. Lucille Tennant, I'm with the Conseil de Development Economique de la Nouvelle Casse. I'm also owner of Cabot Trail Vacations, Harvey Cottages in Point Cross, and a member of the advisory committee. My name is Alex Stephanie, I'm a planner with the Eastern District Planning. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Louis Pope. I'm also a planner with the EDPC, and I'll be giving a presentation regarding the stock report we concluded for the the amendment today. My name is Scanner Gamus, I'm an OPA contractor and uh, I'm a member of the advisory committee. I'm Jolene Lalat, um, I'm the executive director here at Conseil des Arts and uh, I'm an elected member of the CSEP school board and also a business owner of um, multiple um, vacation home uh, rentals here in the community and also a member of uh, this committee. So the, the, so the purpose of this me meeting is to, um, we're going to have a presentation on the staff report, and then when we're finished that, we will have a committee discussion amongst the committee, and then, and then we will open the floor to any questions or any concerns that you have with respect to uh, this process. Um, I see the gentleman in the front with it. Do you have just a process question? Yes, sir. I would have appreciated an acknowledgement that we are on the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq right at the beginning of this meeting. Thank you. That. I would hope that that is, does not happen again. Thank you. So the um, the uh, uh, again the purpose of the meeting is to go over the uh, the uh, staff report with respect to recreational vehicles. Uh, we'll have a discussion at the committee level, and then we will open it up to take questions from any of the audience. Lewis? So thank you so much to 
everyone who came out today. I can appreciate your time is valuable. So I have concluded this staff report into as short of a presentation as possible. For those who have not had the opportunity or are not familiar with the certain concepts that we're going to be discussing today. So to start this off, this is the Area Advisory Committee for the Shitty Camp area. Uh, and we have had a member request for the residential rural zone, which as we'll cover it, is quite large throughout the Shady Camp planning area, and we'll represent that later. So a quick presentation that we're going to summarize for you today is I'm going to cover the, the location and the zoning area for Shady Camp. I'm going to cover the zones that are currently permitting campgrounds, as that is the biggest piece of what we are here for today. I'll be covering the current status as well as the current zoning that it is within the Shady Camp planned area, as well as staff highlighted options that we have presented uh, to this committee. I will then be covering our staff recommendation towards the end of the presentation. So moving forward, this is the Shady Camp planned area. We can see here that there are numerous zones throughout this area, from commercial to residential to mixed use. This is available on our website as well at the edpc.ca if this map is not, <laughs> is not the highest quality here on the projector in front of you. So we can see that there are numerous zones throughout this area. The two that are permitting campgrounds are the predominantly green RR1, the residential rural zone, as well as the mixed use zone. So hopefully at this kind of scale you can see just the areas that are permitting campgrounds that are currently in place. So going through the policy review, the current status is they are permitted within the mixed use as well as the rural residential RR1 zone. So those were the green as well as the blue on the map that we just saw. So currently campgrounds are located within the RR1 zone as of right. We have located, identified three predominant campgrounds that we are seeing and they are located within this RR1 zone. The setbacks within this zone for all uses and structures are the same regardless of use and they can be seen here. We have the minimum lot area, minimum lot frontage, front yard, side yard, rear yard, and the height of the structures available on the lot. We can see that this varies between the lot area for municipal sewer services and on-site services. This is referencing if you're using a well or a septic tank as opposed to the municipal services such as sewer. As we move forward, we can see that this is a long use of the a list of uses permitted within the RR1 zone as it currently stands. We can see this ranges from single detached dwellings to mobile homes, to cottages, to forestry uses, post offices. This is a very diverse zone that really permits a lot of uses. I bolded campgrounds and associated uses at the bottom as this seems to be the, the most, I mean that's why we're here today, uh, is the removal of this from this land use bylaw. So we have presented within our staff report, we've done some research and concluded based on the policies that we currently have in place and what was presented to us by a concerned resident of the Shetty Camp Land area, we have four options that we have currently presented. I'm going to quickly go over what those might be, uh, and that's just to get this committee talking on certain points. If the committee wishes to take this in another direction, we would love to hear that as well. We are here to, to serve and assist this community uh, as it sees fit. The current use, or the current, the first option that we have presented here today, is to keep campgrounds as, as a permitted use within the RR1 zone. This would also increase the setbacks in the zone and would be, it would be permitted through the site plan process. This varies from its current state where it would be able, be able to apply for a development permit which does not involve uh, conversations with ourselves and our team regarding landscaping, lighting, uh, negotiations on the retention of vegetation for the property. These are all things that we can do through the site plan process. Uh, this would also involve a notification which through the Municipal Government Act is 30 meters around that property. So say if your neighbor was to apply for a campground in this zone or with the site plan process, we would conduct an analysis of what residents or uses are within 30 meters of that from all of its boundaries. So not just from the site itself, but all of the boundaries of the law. So this would involve that and this would involve once you've got that notification letter, there's a 14-day appeal period that you can present your case to the council and they will hear that out and we can have that discussion. If not, if there are no appeals, that would go ahead based on the, the negotiations that our team would have with the, with the proposed use. So that's the first of the options that we presented here. The second is to keep them as a permitted use, but to, per 
permit them through a development agreement. So development agreements are slightly more in there's they're slightly more strict in terms of what they in terms of what we can negotiate with the applicant. So this can range from hours of operation to negotiating specifics for the maintenance of the site to wastewater systems, landscaping, as well as a percentage of land that can be built on. This is again coming in a little bit more of a strict site plan. We require site plans in forms of maps for this, as well as conversations uh, in various forms. Uh, this would then go to committees for feedback before going to council for approval. So if we had a development agreement here today, we would be presenting it to this committee, who would then give us our, their feedback and we would pass it up the chain until it eventually went to council and would involve a public hearing. So this is the case where you would be able to come and give your feedback before council makes their final decision, just so that we can have that in. It's also advertised in local newspapers. So that really gives the community a sense of engagement and feedback through the whole process. The third option is that we kind of take that out of the other permitted zones, and we establish a campground zone within the municipal planning strategy, as well as the land use bylaw. So this would permit uh, any land wishing to become a campground would have to go through a rezoning process uh, and then they could, you know, this would involve special setbacks, special provisions, special requirements. And those are quite broad as to what they can, what they could be. Hypothetically, we could introduce setbacks that are, I'm just, setting numbers right now is very hypothetical. Uh, 100 feet away from X, Y, or Z, as a brief example. So this would involve the removal of campgrounds from their current zone, which is mixed use and RR1, and establish a specific campground zone. The fourth option that we have here today is that the land use bylaw remains the same. If we hear from this committee that in their current state it is absolutely fine, uh, we do have to acknowledge that you know, we have that option as well. So the start recommendation is that action is taken with regard to increasing regulations for campground within Shetty Camp. We're leaving the specifics of this to the discussion with the committee level and with the community, uh, as the community and this committee will know on a greater level what this community is seeking out of these decisions. So thank you so much. That's my presentation. I would have a question. Uh, where's Councillor Crichton? Oh, sorry. Stay up here. Thank you. I didn't know. Sorry about that. Yeah, so I think what we're looking for is some committee discussion at, at the committee level. So, I, I, you know, we've gone through the, the various options. The, the, the last option we're not recommending is that we just leave it the same the way it is now. Obviously there's interest in this and concern about them, so the first one would be, but yeah, please, any I questions? Just, I just want to make um, a statement as to, could we define the region that we're talking about? Is the Shetty Camp region from Willie James, where we saw Willie James to the National Park boundary, the entrance, is that the region? Or uh, it would be the planned area. I can try to bring up that map again if you'd like. Just so everyone knows yeah. exactly what yeah, we're doing. Yeah, and I think that's an important part because it is outside of the zoned area, like uh, St. Joseph Des Moines, uh, further south, uh, actually all the way to Inverness, Inverness, there is no zone. So in those areas, uh, this, this document has no impact on the rest of Inverness County areas that have no zone. So south of uh, do you have that map? There's a there's a river that's the end of the um, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so where that that lake is, where the road splits there, that's the end of the planned area. So everything between the park and that stream is the uh, the Shetakam plan area. That's the area where the zone applies, and it's only that area that we're talking about. And right now. Everything in green in the rural residential zone. There is zoning, but campgrounds are permitted. South of that, there is no zoning, and by default, campgrounds are permitted. So again, any more questions from the committee? Like I, th I think there's with those three options, 
apart from leaving things the way they are. They really range from leaving them in the zone, but tightening up the requirements for, for them. So somebody would still come and get a permit from us, but we would have um, setback requirements. Right, right now, the, uh, the requirements for a campground in the rural residential zone are minimal. They're permitted. There's no landscaping requirements. There's setback from property lines. But that's it. That's basically it. What's the definition of a campground? How many? Is it two? Is it seven? Is it ten? What's the definition? Of how many? Like for lot purposes? What's the definition of a campground? So, uh, is there a definition in the document? Uh, I don't believe that there is a definition. I don't have. I don't have a Wi-Fi. <laughs> so I'm, I'm literally dead in the water. I, I don't believe we have a defined definition. In that document? Not before. Not so what we've done before is um, um, two and more, two or more. That's what we've been using. Two or more for a. Um, uh, see, it's it, it, it been less of an issue because they're permitted. Right, it gets more of an issue if they're not permitted, right? Because if it's not permitted, then you want to know exactly what we're talking about. But if somebody came to us and said, I want to do a little campground, I'm going to do two, two, we would say, okay, that's fine, it's permitted in the zone, right? If we say, if this is part of, this is part of what we would want to do though, right? Because you might, as a committee, say, well, two, in our mind, isn't a campground, it's not a campground, and that should just be permitted, right? But if it's a third one, then it is a campground, and then we're going to say, okay, now that you're a campground, these extra requirements are going to, to apply. But right now, we just, you know, because they're permitted, somebody says, I want to do a, I want to do, um, I want to rent two trailers on my property, then that's what we do. So I, I am seeing hands. I just if, if I don't know how the committee feels. You want to just open this up to the floor, or to have that kind of a discussion? Well, <clears throat> I would have one question to start with. I think we have two different two options here. We have already two campgrounds up and running. The plans, the, the, the money has been put in and everything. So are we going to move in and then have a new bylaw that will change and then they have, they have started their plan and then at the same time can we go and change or amend a bylaw that would change their plans later on? Okay, so that's a very important point. Say, for example, we come to the committee comes to the conclusion that we simply do not want any more campgrounds in that green area that was up there, right? The existing ones have a have a legal non-conforming status. That doesn't, so they are still permitted to to continue. Um, They're, they're, they're able to expand to the, the extent of the lot because it's a use, not a structure. But if they cease operation for more than 12 months, then they can't reestablish except in accordance with the, with the zoning. So there, is, um, there are um, rights that the existing campgrounds, and, and there's also Shirley Camp Island as well as the two but there's Other also one. a third one in, in to the tank along the Shed Camp River. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. Because they're permitted in the zone, you know, they're... But if, you're, if you exist now as a campground owner, what this will do if in, in a most severe situation is make you legal non-conforming. And 
And if you cease operations and you can't re-establish the operation except in conformity with the, with the zone. So say we went um, and said, well, they, they need um, a new tourist commercial zone. And you have to have the tourist commercial zone to, um, to operate a campground. But what we would likely do in that case is identify the existing ones and give them that tourist commercial zone. So that's, in that case, they're no longer legal non-conforming, but they've got the new zone that we've decided they're going to have, and we would apply it to the existing properties, right? Then they don't have legal non-conforming status. They have, they have the new zone, and they're permitted in the new zone. So there's a number of options, but I think, I think as a committee and as a municipality, we're very cognizant of the importance of recognizing the existing businesses that have established under the existing uh, regime. So that's, that's, um, that's a helpful discussion to have for sure. Um, so again, the, the committee, the worst case scenario we say, the easiest thing to say would be, okay, campgrounds are no longer permitted in that zone. We remove it from the rural residential zone. Existing ones become non-conforming. The other option is we say, okay, we're going to do a, a zone, tourist commercial zone, and put some cabins, campgrounds, some associated uses in that zone, apply it to those different properties. Anybody new has to rezone to that zone. Existing ones are protected because they've got the, they, they're recognized under, with the new zone. Development agreements, site plan approvals are a little different. They'd still be permitted in the zone going through a process. The existing ones would be recognized and recognized more than legal nonconforming because they would be permitted in the zone even though they don't have a development agreement or a site plan. So. Um, so that's probably as clear as mud. But so, so we are again. So from the committee's point of view, so you had a second question, Councillor? No. That was it? Okay. So maybe, I mean, nobody's throwing anything yet, so maybe we could, if the committee's okay with it, open it up to the floor, see what other people have to say. I have seen a few yeah. hands. Yeah. This gentleman in the front row, did you still have a question or did I answer all your questions? You're good. So okay. maybe back. So I have two questions. Sure. Uh, so the, one of the first questions is: This is zoning about the Chetikon area. We live in Saint Joseph. In one, there is no zoning. What does? What do we need to do? We have waterfront property, and it's beautiful. What? What do we need to do to introduce zoning? thoughtful zoning okay. that accommodates people who are already there and people who want to develop businesses. How do we get zoning in that part of the municipality? And the second question I have... Right, but maybe I'll just answer your first question because okay. if you give me more than one, I'm going to be confused. <laughs> um, so the province of Nova Scotia, so they're all across the province of Nova Scotia, there's large portions of the province that have no land use controls whatsoever. Uh, the majority of Inverness County, everything in Victoria County except the deck, large portions of Richmond County, large portions of Antigonish County, Guysboro County, go right across the province. And so the problem with, with this, and I can and I often use the example in Mabu with the um, uh, Halifax Medical. Halifax Medical wanted to set up in Mabu with a um, a, um, a research facility. And they had a vision of this campus-like uh, complex and doctors coming from all over the world to live in Nauvoo and, and, and be at this research complex. And I met with the doctors and they wanted to know, the first question they had was, uh, what's the zoning in, in Nauvoo and what do we have to do to uh, make this, this happen, right? And I said, uh, there is no zoning in Nauvoo. There is no zoning whatsoever in Nauvoo. And so they said, well, well, we could spend millions of dollars on this research complex 
and somebody could set up a uh, scrapyard or a pig farm right beside us. I said, yeah, that's correct. And he said, well, that, that threatens our whole business plan. Our investors are not going to take that kind of risk. And if you drive through Madeline now, I think Halifax Medical has a little storefront. Maybe. I, they, don't have, they definitely don't have what their vision was for that community. So the province is, and, and a lot of times people say, oh, no zoning, that's wonderful, I can do what I want. Yes, but your neighbor can do what they want. And, they, and the whole purpose of land use planning is to, to minimize those conflicts, land use conflicts, right? So the province has said, well, this is untenable, um, and they've told the um, municipality to get three years to bring in land use documents for all of the province that is unzoned. And um, we're in year one of that. Now that's been COVID delayed a little bit, uh, but, but the municipality, District Planning Commission is working with our partners and the municipalities at looking at um, uh, starting that process. We're doing some background research for it. So with respect to your first question, stay tuned. The municipality is doing something uh, with respect to bringing in what the province has called minimal planning regulations. And, and by, the, by the very nature of it, it has to be a, um, um, a public process. So there will be a public participation component to it. And your second question, if that... Yes, the second question is about resources and impact, not only on the residents, but the environment and, and, and use. Water comes to my mind. Um, water, uh, you know, campgrounds, uh, condominium developments, uh, all of that. For people who don't live within the city limits and they have access to water, and if I remember correctly, two years ago, the wells in, uh, in the city of Shetikon, they were really dry. So where does the water come from for all those people? They're transients, they're tourists. They did not necessarily value the use of water and preservation of water because they are just passing through. So use of water, and also where does the water go? Around here, the land doesn't work. So um, what is, you know, those um, building permits that have been granted already, have they taken into account not only where the water is coming from, but where it's going? OK, you're not going to like the answer to this question. Uh, but the answer is they, they, we just didn't take that into consideration. I mean, that's why we're, we're here, right? Because those land use controls are, are not in place. So um, what all we, all we made sure that they had when we uh, issued permits for the campground is what the zone requires. Now, now there's other agencies that get involved, uh, provincial agencies, but all we looked at is, is so. So the zone, what's your zone? Well, it's the R R1 zone, and campgrounds are permitted. So they got past the, the first phase. You know, what are the requirements in the zone for campgrounds? Well, you've got setback requirements from abutting properties, and, and, that, and then that's it. So we made sure that they showed us a plan that showed the, the uh, sites being back the required distance from from the property. Now, on top of that, we also talked to the Department of Transportation to make sure that they had a um, commercial uh, access permit. But well, we could have issued our permit without them having it. And then if they didn't get it, well, that's the problem. But we also made sure that they had their that. And, and we touched base with who else? The Department of Environment. Environment to see what they had to say, which was? And DNR as well. 
natural resource we just because of the stream in one case, but on the second one because of the because of the, the, the bank. shoreline the bank. So we, we, we did touch base with the Department of Natural Resources, who gave us a letter saying that the bank at the back of the property was okay. So they were also on that site and were able to in inspect it for any concerns that they had. Uh, we unfortunately missed them by about five minutes when we were there, but we do have it right that the Department of uh, Natural Resources didn't have any concerns with the property. They also did go through the Department of Environment with regards to the well and the septic system or the sewer system that they do have in place on that property. So, but I think the thing is, from our point of view, and really I, I, I understand the concern about the specific proposals, but what we're looking for, hoping to get, is kind of a, like a broader consensus, perhaps, on how to deal with new ones, right? So, so the committee says, well, the way to deal with new ones is to stop them from happening. I can, I can write that, right? Um, but if you say, well, you know, tourism is extremely important for Shredder Camp, and we need to be make some accommodations for, for tourists, it's important for the businesses, the restaurants, da, 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 da. then how do we, how do we um, re respectfully of the environment, the water, the impacts on the neighbors, all of that, still permit them to help happen in a, in a, um, in, in a more or less conflict Lady here. So perhaps a misunderstanding, but is is it a fact that each development that goes in, whatever its size, whatever it might happen to be, is there an environmental impact assessment done prior to each of these developments beginning? No. Why? Because a why is a good question. Um, so, so there's two things with environmental impact assessments. Environmental impact assessments is, is typically a provincial requirement. And there is a threshold of, at the size of the development before um, uh, an, an environmental impact assessment is triggered. That's, that's more of a formal um, EIA under the, the Department of Environment legislation. What the municipality could do as part of a rezoning process, for example, if that's the option to say, is, um, okay, you can rezone to this new tourist commercial zone that permits campgrounds, but as part of that rezoning process, we're going to require an environmental impact assessment that addresses, and you want to, you want to define it, addresses A, B, and C. Because the developer wants to be very, most developers, a lot of developers will tell me, I don't care what the rules are, I just want to know what the rules are. So if, if we were, as a committee said, well, for a campground, um, we're going to require you to do an environmental impact assessment, but we don't really define what we mean by that and leave it very open-ended. So then, you know, somebody spends a lot of money on an EIA and then we come back and say, oh, well, you didn't cover piping plumbers, right? Not trying to be facetious, but, you know, whatever, right? Something obscure that they didn't think about. And, you, and any developer is going to say, okay, I, I'm not going to take the risk to subject myself to an EIA unless I know what the parameters are. So this committee, if that's the way we want to go, say, say okay, and EIA is required for one of these things, an environmental impact assessment, that addresses A, B, and C, X, Y, and Z, whatever those things are, and then at least they have a, a framework to come to the committee and say, okay, you told me I've had to look at these things, I've looked at these things, they're not issues for this site, or they are issues and we've done this to remediate, and therefore, and then we can move it, move it along. But the question as to why, well, why is it not? These, anyway, that's, a, that's a big question. Perhaps the definition of sorts should be developed. Sorry? Perhaps the definitions in terms of those things that are not there now should be developed. There are definitions. There are. But, 
Sorry, this gentleman on the end? Me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm Vic Melanson. I am one of the developers of the Point Cross Beach RV Park. Um, and it's a really good discussion this group that's going on. And your questions and concerns are my questions and concerns. Um, throughout the process, uh, for the last three and a half years, four years, I've embraced the uh, Department of Environment. I've asked them those questions. Do I need a, an environmental impact assessment? Yes, you do. If you're going to develop a certain amount of square footage over the wetlands. So with the wetlands alteration that we've done, it did not require an impact assessment. It did, however, require that a professional engineer be qualified for wetland alteration. They don't come cheap. So when you're talking about an uh, environmental impact assessment, they start at $60,000. It's not just throwing out some words out there if we don't need it. If we do need it, it it's awesome. We do have a, an agency out there, it's called the Department of Environment. They've become my close friends. I mean, I, I don't invite them over for a turkey dinner, but I've been liaising with them with every step of the process uh, moving forward. The other part is the um, questions about, you know, the water use and all the above. I had an engineer come through and he actually assessed the, the, the property. And um, absolutely, I, I love environment as well. I bring to you, uh, you know, my background is electrical engineering. I've got 30 years of uh, Armed Forces service. I love nature. Why? I wanted to develop the, this campground in anticipation of booming the economic growth here in Chetikang, which is basically, you know, in a depressive state. Um, good points. I'm shaking a little bit. Why? These are points that basically other government departments cover. And to cover these over at the municipal level, do, so one of the questions that I put forward to the community, do you really want to go there? Do you have the staff? Do you have the expertise? Do you have the professional engineers? Do you have the civil engineers that are wetland alteration qualified? Do you have the engineers to do these assessments? It's all good to throw spaghetti at the wall and hopefully some of it sticks. However, there are specialists out there and these people don't come cheap. I got one engineer that drives out here, so just for him to come here is 1500 bucks and he hasn't done anything. He's, hey, Vic, I'm here. I owe him $1,500 without even doing anything. I had Ducks Unlimited that I've spoken to, that I put permits through. Just that permit alone was in excess of almost $10,000. Why? Because I care for habitat as well. We're not just fly-by-night people that are developing these properties. We come with a vast knowledge of background. My background is electricity, and it's not environment. That's why I hire people to do the work. Thank you very much. And, uh, so, so Mr. Melanson raises some important points for our committee and for the the, um, the from the municipality's point of view. We've got minimal zoning requirements that are met very simply by. It's a, it's a campground which is permitted and the side backyard requirements are the, the yard requirements for that. That's, that's all in the development has. So Melanson is developing in an a area where there's a wetland. And so other agencies absolutely get in, involved in his situation. But there are other developments that that's not the case. Right? All, that, all that they need to do is, is get the permit from us and they're good to go. Right? Um, so, so there is a concern about redundancy, that the municipality shouldn't be doing things that other agencies are doing, and we're cognizant of that. But at the same time, with respect to campgrounds, we're doing a minimal amount of stuff from, from the municipal point of view. Right? So, Jolene? I love camping, I love campgrounds, um, but I know what a campground is. A, a camp this summer, it's people are on vacation, they're, they want to relax, they want to party, they want to sing, they want to drink. It's amazing. But I find there's, there's spaces for that and spaces that are, that are meant for that. So, to me, I would not buy a house if I knew a campground was about 30 meters from my property. My property <coughs> will probably go down if there is a campground next to it, or two next to it, or three next to it. 
So I feel for the people who, who all of a sudden have a beautiful, have a beautiful property, have a beautiful house, and all of a sudden, you know, it's gonna. And I've been to campgrounds this summer where, you know, a timeout is midnight every night, and it was a party, and kids were sleeping, but uh, I was awake. So I, I feel for the people around these these, um, these businesses. There's a need for them. There's a but there's a space for them, and. To me, I, so that's one thing. And number two, I believe that the community, and as you mentioned, you know, no environmental, that just makes, we're in 2020. And I mean, Nova Scotia get with the times, the municipality get with the times, enough. Enough with this, there's no laws, and like if I was in San Jose, if you went, I'd be freaking out right now, knowing that anybody can build anything next door to me. I would be livid. I didn't even know it was being zoned. That's, to me, Cape Breton and Bernays County, one of the most beautiful places in the world, has no zoning. To me, it just blows my mind and it upsets me. And I'm very happy that uh, Vic Melançon is has a conscience. I am a con I can't speak English. Has a conscience. <laughs> has a conscience. And thank you. And I, I and thank you. But they're not all like you. And they're not all people. You know, there's da 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 da. -da go to, to. We follow the rules. Have a nice day. And that. It saddens me, it makes me want to just, okay, then that's fine. Let's have this meeting, <coughs> let's hear what people have to say, and just let's, let's just, we're in 2020, enough. Just enough of this, no regulations. And I'd rather have a pig farm next door than a campground, but for other reasons, but, because it's like you said, it's fun, it's parties, it's families, it's, and, it's, and they're amazing, and we need them in our communities, but there's certain places that we need. So I think as a, as a committee, um, I think we just have to decide, or we have to, we have to make a decision because there's a lot of, um, um, how do I say, a lot of, um, you know, issues that came up and thank God they did, and now we have the opportunity to talk and, and share, but yeah, as a community member, and there are vacant lots beside my house, and, you know, I didn't know somebody could just pop up a campground next to my house, and that, yeah, it, it, to me, it just bothers me that, we're so lack in, in regulations, if it's environmental or not. And yeah, so that's my two cents. So uh, I don't know if, um, I don't know if Lewis, you could, you have like a four different um, options? Yes. Yeah, you don't have them all on one slide though. Unfortunately, I don't, it's so much text. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. And yeah. then summarize. Yeah, and I, it, to me, the option I would love to have is any option where the community has a say, um, has a say in what, in what in anything. If it's a, if it's a campground, if it's a condo, if it's a, and I believe Halifax Biomedical actually left in Bernays and it went to Vedek. I think they're in Vedek now because they could have more uh, regulations. But um, that's just my two cents. And uh, and I and I want businesses to go to study camp. I want. But to me, having the people around them have their value devaluated, that's not fair to them. That's not fair to the people who have land next door, uh, who have houses <coughs> next door. To me, that, that's, but like you said, there's no regulation, so it doesn't matter. So we can't go back. We can't go back, and it's going to be sad for those people, for those homeowners or landowners. And like I said, if I was from San Jose, you went, I'd be freaking out. Your counselor is right up there. He's there. <laughs> but he's very nice. He's very nice. Anyway, that's just my two cents, and I, like oh, I said, so that's, I, a, that's important to, to, to express that. And, and maybe I'll just grab this gentleman here in the front row. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Don Bain. Um, so, I, my name is Jaren, Jaren Felix, I've met you before, and uh, I'd just like to say that I grew up in this community, and I moved away from university, came back after my studies because I saw room for growth and opportunity here. So in the business that I'm now into my second year, uh, and I'm trying to open more businesses and continue to contribute to the community. Uh, and you mentioned the example of Halifax Biomedical, um, which is a multi-million dollar company who wanted to put its roots here, and that's excellent. Um, but we also have to consider the small family homes. You know, um, these people have worked very hard to have what they have, and what 
is built next to them and their property values are just as expensive or just as important as uh, any development that's going to happen here. And I'm all for development. I'm here to develop things for the community. I'm happy when other things are happening. Um, but things just seem backwards, to say the least. Uh, to put things into perspective, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I understand, you can develop a campground without going through a development agreement, going through council, advertising the paper to have uh, community input, but at the same time, I have an existing bu uh, building that's a mixed-use building. It's both commercial and residential, and I want to add um, two bachelor apartments in it, and we all know housing is a big issue here. I have to go through a development agreement to do that. Yeah, that's, that's, correct. Not, that's, that's correct. And no one from the outside, there's nothing happening on the outside of the building. It's not going to affect any of my neighbors. I'm adding more housing to the community, or at least I'm trying to, but that's hindered. I can't, I can't move on with that because I have to go through a six-month development agreement process. But something as substantial as a campground doesn't have to go through the same process. Are you in a different zone? Yeah, I'm in a waterfront zone. Yeah, so basically anything that happens along the waterfront is by development agreement. And, and you had to do a development agreement for even just to get the liquor license, right? So Absolutely. that's your restaurant as well. Well, existing restaurant, yes, I have to go through yeah, development so, agreement. So the, expand on my existing license. Right, but we may, we, you still have to go through the development agreement to do that. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure we negotiated yeah. A development agreement went through the public hearing and all of that for the. Um, is the other restaurant yours, right at the? Yeah, the 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 is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. you did, yeah. So we did yeah, have your point, your point's well it. taken, but I, and. I, I'm just trying to. I'd like to say, well, I wish I could say, well, I didn't write the document, but I probably, yeah, probably did. But um, you know, at the time, that's what the community input input was. That you know, along the waterfront, we want more control over it. And I think realistically that the time the committee probably thought in the more rural area, no water, no sewer, there's an existing campground on Shedekamp Island, uh, maybe at the time there were others, that's recognized them in the zone and permit them as permitted uses. You know, the documents hold and uh, things change. So, you know, I, I, as to the general conversation, I think we're all in agreement that the, the land use controls, the regulations that are in place for Shedd Camp are something that need to be um, uh, looked at closely. There is a requirement to do a plan review, and, and Shedd Camp is, is one of the points that is, is um, in, the, in the line for the land use plan. But yeah, I mean, to your general point, yeah, that's unfortunate, but that's that's it. I, I, I'm not here to complain about my own developments. I'm just trying to put some perspective on, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, and I, I... There's a gentleman back there that's had his hand up. Where are yeah, the gentleman speaking the last of plan time. review, should the plan not be on a planning cycle? Isn't that just standard practice to have, um, you know, zoning bylaw plans and, and zoning maps be reviewed? Through a broad public review process. Yeah, so uh, the, municipal government act, the municipal government act used to require that every five years, and then right. they took that out of the act because it wasn't happening every five years. So, what right. basically. So instead of addressing the issue of getting it on a five year cycle, it's just to the, to the um, planning review process. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the other thing is that the review happens. So, municipal council does, and so the last review, the, the review we're working on right now is for Inverness given some of the stresses on that on that community. And then the next one is Shed Okay. The but yeah, but the act does the act does say that they need to be reviewed on a on a um, it used to say every five years but doesn't say that anymore. Just There's just been a lot that's changed in twenty years and, and I know we're looking at one situation in isolation. But this year alone there's been so many development related concerns and issues that have been raised. Uh, some of those issues haven't been raised the right way, you know, through Facebook and bullying. There's been 
other activities that have kind of discouraged really a positive discussion on these types of issues. And, um, you know, like, and I'm not really sure, you know, what the process is. I am seeing it now, but it hasn't in fact been transparent, like, who's on this committee or even what this committee is until I showed up today. So maybe I'm not even, I'm not going through the, the communication channels that have been in place, but um, I had no idea that there was going to be a vote of people uh, in the committee where I'm not really sure who decided what the information is. So, um, can we talk a little bit about how the committee can I don't want to get away from the issue, but it is something I know that's in the minds of a number of people in here. Okay, so area advisory committees are something that um, are uh, appointed by council. And there's a number of ways we look for people on an area advisory committee. Uh, we, we, um, we have advertised for area advisory committee members in the past. Um, we do put a, a fair bit of weight on the councillor, trying to get the councillor to, to find people for the committee. Um, to be honest with you, the experience we've had in the past has been that um, we get very few, people need to be voluntold to sit on the committee. Right. And, um, yeah. yeah, I might have, you know, I've been counselor for eight years, and what I did for the first four years, five years, uh, there was a committee, but it had been dissolved, you know, there was nobody there. So I tried to get uh, some people, you know, like Kevin and Lucille and uh, Jodine and everybody, and I had to go pick and choose, and nobody's interested except when it comes and hit on the back door. Right. You know, that's the, the major problem that we do find, that I do find, and I mean, it's like, uh, you know, as the councillor for Shine Camp area doesn't make me go, I have a few things to say, and I'm pretty straightforward. You know, I welcome everybody in Shine Camp. I welcome people that were originally from Shalikan, they moved out, they came back, and anywhere from anywhere, all over the world. But, is Shalikan closed? I'm going to ask you a few things. The gym, I had five cars in the last two weeks. The chips of mine, there's too many cars on the road. Paving plan. It's a big problem. There's a lot of park holes. But then, can't get a paving plan. It has to go in the park. Where they they post, post it on a certain Facebook. The plan has been gone since October 1st. And then, they're not sure if they're, if they're going to be back. And it's just can we say to the topic, Alfred, like, you know, I hear you. Excuse me, I'm not finished, ma'am. <laughs> okay. okay. You're getting right. off topic. Okay. No, 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 no respect, but I, I, let me yes, finish. I, I started. Call. I don't want you to think I'm walking out on you. I just need to take a call right now. No, I'm, but I okay. tell you what, I just want to tell you how I feel as a counselor. I'm stuck. I'm yeah. working hard to get people in. I'm working hard to get business moving. I'm working hard to get taxes for the people so that we can lower our taxes. And here what I get. That's that's my point, you know. Mind you, I'm not finished. What we need is control, yeah. which we don't have. What we need is an area that we all get together and work together. But you know, I don't want to be in a position like this because I'm a go-getter and I respect the seniors, I respect everybody, but at the same time, respect the people that want to come in and do business in my community. That's the thing right. I, I don't like. Go right ahead. Thank you. Yeah. My name's Alan Platt. I'm the one who has requested amendments to the bylaws that currently is proposed if enacted. What brought that about was this um, RV park that is now approved uh, in Point Cross. Um, and from the, what I understand, because I don't know what their plans are, but from what I understand from the planning process, 
and um, surveys department is that they're planning to put in 139 RV stations. Anybody can drive down the Cabot Trail right now, which, by the way, is the reason why tourists want to come to Cape Breton, is the Cabot Trail. And what we're going to be looking at is a parking lot of RVs. We don't know what they're going to do in terms of uh, wastewater, sewage. We don't know. That. We understand, and I only understand this incidentally, that they're not going to have a septic system, they're going to have a holding tank. Uh, this, this is a nine-acre uh, uh, property with 139 plans right now. That, it's just abysmal. You can't have that happen on Cape Breton Island. That doesn't promote tourism. That denigrates tourism. That keeps people away. If I'm coming from Ontario as I retired, do I want to come and buy a property where I'm going to have 139 RVs potentially parked next to me? No. I wouldn't come here. I wouldn't spend my money. And is there any process that has proven that 139 RVs needed to be brought here? Are they going to be bringing business into the area? They're using people from outside the area to do the construction work. They're not giving work to Chesson Brothers. They're not giving uh, work to Corey Chesson. No. So these people are only interested in one thing. From my perspective, is to try and use the, the Cabot Trail as a lure to try and make as much money as they can with minimal investment. But, I mean, that's the purpose of any business that goes on. I beg your pardon? Anybody that goes in business wants to make money. Now, listen, listen, now, listen, now, listen, now, listen now, no, no, this now, is not talking now, about making now, money. No, this is talking about promoting and protecting what is a pristine part of our culture, so and that's the kind of trip. So can I just interject before I just, like I, I, you know, Mr. O'Coin, I, I appreciate where you're coming from. So that's exactly what we're having to do, right? It's a look at ways of helping the community, community to identify responsible development. And I think we all want development to show the hand that want it done correctly. So that's why the, that's why that's why we're here for. And I think the the frustration that's that's experienced in the audience is something that, that we take seriously. To be honest with you, there is a bit of a sea change because it used to be like I I've, I've gone into community after community and um, and being told Nobody from Port Hawkesbury or nobody from Halifax is going to tell me what I can and cannot do with my land. That's a, that's a, that's a predominant sentiment in the rural Nova Scotia. Nobody's going to tell me what to do with my land. And the reason why that is, is because historically, you knew your neighbors, and your neighbors wouldn't do that to you whatever that is. You know, they'd come over and say, look, I'm thinking of doing this on my property, what do you think? And you'd say, oh, well, it's a little bit close to my property, and you'd have a conversation, and you'd do something else, mm -hmm. or move it, or, or there'd be some kind of compromise. That doesn't happen anymore. And so when it, now that it doesn't happen, you need these land use controls, and, and, and the, the, the purpose, the reason I got into planning, and the reason why these two guys got into planning, is to help make our little corner of the world a little bit better, right? So that's what we're trying to do here. I think we're all on the same page on that. It just the question is how do we how do we do that? And so I, this gentleman here in the front. Yeah, this, you know what? Uh, my name is Paul Strong, uh, and I'm a, anyway. I'm really impressed with a lot of words. But I'm not impressed with with the lack of action. You know, we talk here about all of the planning. Planning, uh, you know, is enabled by people coming together to be educated about the area and, and making, you know, really reasonable, rational decisions, not based on our present uh, situation, but based on our future. And that does not happen a great deal in, the, in this community, this village. This is a village, you know, and one of the things that so many people have been asking about 
is about why we do not have more community meetings about exactly these kinds of issues. That's one of the reasons why you're hearing the angst, the emotions here this afternoon. You know, we need to do something about it. We need to have a me a meetings, plural, you know, where we get educated. Uh, wow, that's what you guys are doing this afternoon with us. You are educating us. You are educating us. We need the education so that we can make the right decisions. And the right decisions, a lot of people believe, are not being made. So, you know, anyway. Yeah, so I again, really we're, all, again we're on the same page on this. I mean, I think we're, so a lot of the conversation is around the fact that, you know, the documents are not doing what they should be doing. So I think that's, we can move and second that box established. Hi, uh, I think mean, back to the original intent of the meeting, I think, was you were looking for your committee to look at the four options that were presented. Yeah. My free advice to the committee, you should meet again and look at the first three. The last one, which is stay the course, I think we all agree, is 20 years behind its time. I would suggest to the committee you need to meet again, look at the three other ones that allow communication, conversation, dialogue, restrictions, process. And you also should do a bit of benchmarking. What's Inverness doing? What's Bob Hood doing? What's Fort Hood doing? Rather than reinvent it, we're not the first community looking at a bylaw. You look at those and you come back with a proposal to the community as to what that should look like. To me, that's your role. Yeah, so that's, exactly, sure that's, that's exactly what we were, that's exactly what we were. So, so this meeting was, the intent of this meeting was to have a conversation and then go away and put a little bit more meat on the bones of one of those options. Sure. So, so I, I think we've definitely got some clear direction on that. And our intent would be to have another another meeting. The agenda's not up there anymore. Um, I just want to make a quick point. I agree with the, like, the benchmarks and taking ideas from different communities, bringing it back into discussion. I also want to say, like, what works in Antigonish doesn't necessarily work in Shetty Camp or Petitia Yeah, so no, we, we can't just copy and paste all the solutions. They have to be tailored sure. For, sure. for the area, for the yeah, landscape, yeah, yeah. and the people, and the use. So yeah, so what we would usually do is, is so we bring the planning expertise, but what the committee, the expertise the committee gives me is just that. You know, this is this is way you can do it from a technical planning point of view, and then the committee and members of the public and they say, well, that's not going to work here, but this will. Okay, look, we'll, we'll, that's exactly the kind of conversation we would have. Just one more point, uh, sir. I did do a little bit of research. It's just the uh, the engineering that's coming out of here, and it's all factual based. And one of my key documents that I did, did go to was tourism Nova Scotia. Um, so I read that and basically the, um, there's a report and I'll be more than happy and I've printed out some copies for the committee if you want. And it's based on the uh, demand of RVs and campgrounds in Cape Breton and it's on the rise. It only goes to 2018. However, this clearly demonstrates and it's all factual based. It's from tourism guide and it's all st statistics. And that being said, I did what's called a financial impact. Uh, one of my uh, previous positions was I managed $246 million, and I had to answer to a few generals, and they would say, Vic, what's the impact? So that's where basically my area of expertise. I was not given a lot of time. However, I did do uh, a good research, and there were some good papers done throughout Canada. In 2015, there was an, econ an economic study done across Canada for campgrounds. I use that as one of my views lines as well. So I can Mr. Johnson, can I yep. just interject? No one is saying that yours is not going forward. We're talking no, about I'm, I'm, stopping. I'm not even talking about myself, sir. It's it's more about the global business perspective. I'm looking at it from a point of view. I mean, my children are. I'm a grandfather, so my children are not children anymore. I'm looking at this in the future and going on your point specifically. To bring in a young family here is how we're going to grow the, the region, right? 
It's not specifically just uh, one use of darkness. Oh, yeah, yeah. please. But I think this belongs to just the, on the general. And I think, I guess, yes. we're probably. So the, committee had, so the committee could have said no campgrounds. And that's not what I heard. <coughs> well, right? I'd like to make that proposal, actually. So I'd like you to go through the other proposals that you have again. And um, because the first one where you said, you know, the, the people would be notified who live within 30 meters, well, hell, that's their next door neighbors. I don't even think you have 30 meters across the street from that, that campsite. Okay, so, so that's so, obviously so, that. So, so let me just um, I got help, help you here. a little bit. Can I just finish one, sir? Uh, sir? Um, just to bring back the, um, you know, about the housing, you know, and everything else. And I hear, the, I've heard all the stories, I mean, I've been tackled from all the other government departments, including the municipality. <coughs> I'm on the same page that right here, right? No, you're not. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. At the all. end of the day, we're looking at establishing a business within the community. And take, for example, statistics. Shumanaki Park, which is downtown, just outside of Dartmouth. Go price a home over there. They, uh, a bungalow starts at $600,000. So to say that your clock is, you know, it's, when you hear global statements like that, it has to be backed up with facts. Please, so, please, may I speak? It's all, you know, factual based. So, right. May I please speak? Sure. Can you, Mr. Yes. Milan, so Mr. Milan, so on the general point again, I, I think it's important that we stick on the general point. Is that the um, there? There is a distinction that I think people might be aware of between your proposal and the other proposal, right? It is fundamental. Okay, I think you've got twelve spots in the front, and yeah, thirty-nine total. Thirty-nine total. Yeah. And most of the most of the towards the road, they're very large and they're spaced apart, and they're yes. and, right. And then you go through the, yeah. the marsh, and you've got another number of unserviced sites overlooking the ocean, right? And that was my choice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the third, which is which yeah. is I think my general point, right? Same is one. that what you've done compared to uh, how many sites are there on the other one? There's nine. 96 RVs and 36. This is off the top of my head. Yeah. But about 139. So total campsites as well as RV sites. Oh, they're about the same size of property. Yeah. So so there so one of the things that I'm trying to do as a, again a general principle is not legislate to the lowest common denominator. Right. We 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 should be able to do this so that the conscientious developer comes in, looks at our requirements, and says, that's exactly the kind of development that I had in mind. And so it just fits, right? Then there's the other developer that we're going to be fighting with every step of the way. No, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. And no, you cannot do that, right? And so that's, that's the, uh, that is the spectrum. And I don't want to cast aspersions about um, the other Development, but it is dense, and I think that is a that is a concern, right? right. So, just to get back, so you wanted to make another point. I like I like the review, please, of the three suggestions, and everybody here is agreed in agreement that the fourth one can be eliminated. Yeah, I don't think everybody is. But I don't see a I don't see a recommendation of there or an option that says no more campgrounds. Okay, so the three the, the three options were the first one is right now it's permitted in the rural residential zone. And the first one is to, is it to remove that from the zone? It says increase the setback. The first one was to increase oh, no, the setback. Oh, it's permitted, so to leave it in the, yeah, okay. So, so the first one is to allow it to be still permitted in the rural residential zone, but take a look at the uh, right. requirements for it. So all three of those options are permitting campgrounds to continue. That's, That's right. correct. Do you want me to read? Each one here, the full? Well, I, I think in for the, I don't want to be trying to appear to be hiding things, but they are very simple. One is a development agreement, which is a negotiated agreement with the landowner that's registered against title, and that has 
a number of requirements that we could put into it. It's the most onerous for the developer to go through. I think you would agree with that. So, so there's that one. And then the next one is a site plan. That one happens quicker, but it's still a public process. There's still notification to neighbors. My experience is, so the act says 30 meters. There's no reason why you can't say more than that in your document. But my experience is you notify within 30 meters. You tell a friend, they tell a friend, they tell two more friends, and we got a full space. Well, in this but case, I believe the two property owners are actually living in the states. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So it would be really hard if they got notice that anybody else would know. So maybe instead of... Oh, I see what you're saying for this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, it is, yeah. a, it is a variable, right? So right. you can change. So that's... The, so the first one is a negotiated agreement. The second one is a site plan. It's still notification. Uh, if we turn it down, appeals to council. And then the last one is, is administrative. We just uh, address their proposal and issue permits or not. So those are the three, three uh, proposals. Okay, Mr. Green, it's also the, the one where you would have a, a specific zone that would be set aside for campgrounds and RV parks. For the four? Yes, the last one was do not make it. So the fifth one was do not? No, so the third one was to take okay. campgrounds out of both of the zones yeah. that we have, yeah. and then rezone, or it was the tourist commercial zones that you agreed to. Number right. three, I'll read it to you. A campground zone is established with the intention of permitting campgrounds within Shetty Camp exclusively within this new zone, and will require that new campgrounds undergo the rezoning process via an amendment to the land use bylaw. The committee decides that to properly regulate campgrounds within the planned area, an exclusive zone needs to be established for regulation of these uses. This zone would then have its own set of setbacks and spe special requirements as necessary. The process for rezoning is similar to that of a development Thank you. The other question I have is, um, do you not consider that you might have a conflict of interest serving on this committee since you have a two-trailer campsite? No, it's cap not trail. mine. Mine is not zoned at, or it's not under the registry of joint stocks. It's within the fixed uh, fixed roof. I'm not at RV park or campground. So, so you, um, you, 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 you raise a good point. And, and what we do when we're trying to get a committee is we're trying to... So we want people on the committee that have vested interests in the community. This committee is an advisory committee, it's not a decision-making committee. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it's advice that's given to council, council makes a decision. If, there's a, if you own a campground, then you better declare a conflict of interest yeah. and get away from, get out of the room. Right? When you say council, are you talking about the municipality of Inverness County? That's right. That's the decision-making body with respect to this. This local committee is just advisory. So from my point of view, it's helpful for me to have a tourist operator on the committee so, so they can say, well, this is what I think. And I'm not the only tourist operator on the committee. No, no, so yeah, but I, it just, it, it sure. just but, but I guess just the general and point, right? So that we, so that we know, and the contractor, so the contractor can say, oh, that's, that's just not going to work, right? Or, but we know where he's coming from, right? It, it, when we're on a committee level and he's saying, uh, as a contractor and I, and I build homes in the community, it's, it's wonderful for us to have that diversity on the committee. So she's not in conflict because this is not a decision-making body. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, in fact, I, I, and again, what we know when she says, or Jolene says, this is what I think, they're coming from a, from a um, tourist accommodation point of view. So, Hi, John. Um, you know, when I first read the, the Shetty Camp Community Plan, right in the, the very first couple of paragraphs, it talks about the beauty of, of uh, the island and uh, the, the visuals, you know, and they want, you know, the plan wanted to keep um, or protect that kind of vision of the building. Well, 
you know, I've lived in every single province or territory or visited each of them. And I admire the deck as an example when we talk about trailers because those four uh, RV campgrounds in the deck are back off the highway and they're sheltered or they're protected visually by trees. Yeah. That's not the case around here. Okay, so and, to, to, before you go any further. Okay. The campgrounds of the deck yep. are outside of the deck. Just and they're polytech windows that is and right are, on the highway. Which are, yeah, but they are all in unzoned areas. Right from the, because the, the only thing that's deck is zoned in the deck, and we're doing the deck plan review right now. So, so um, is from Tim Hortons through everything towards the lake and, and the island in the, in the, uh, from the Trans Canada up to maybe the next exit? No, it doesn't even make the next exit. It, it's halfway up. So, so those campgrounds that you're giving as good examples are developers who have taken upon themselves to say, yeah, I'm going to keep the trees. But I noticed when I drove back from, from uh, the deck last night, yesterday afternoon, that the trees by the one down right on the door are pretty well gone. I can see all of them inside there, which I didn't see before. Right. So I guess, I guess what I'm saying is that I went through the recreation leadership uh, uh, course at the University of Waterloo, and one of our courses, just one of many, had to do with planning. And so what my point is, is that is intelligent, what I would call intelligent design. And there's no reason why this committee or any other committee or any other bylaw officers could not incorporate intelligent design into of the planning committee. Absolutely. And that's what the public here wants. Yeah, absolutely. I so, so I think that's a, your general point. That's not a problem. You know? Yeah. It's something we very much like encourage, but we need that those policies in place to be able to ask developers of these campgrounds to do that. Without the policy in place that was done when we consulted the community for this previous plan, that was not the feedback that is incorporated in this document. But when we are moving forward and we're seeing these concerns, we can begin to incorporate that because that is a fantastic idea, and it is something that Alex and I graduated three years ago. We 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 love that idea of that you know that community design, those urban design principles. It's it's too fresh in our minds. So it's that idea that we want to engage, and that's why we're having you know engaging with the community like this now. Just to make another point. My concern for and the reason why I, I propose a an amendment to the bylaw, which is much narrower, and I, and I applaud your report and what you're suggesting in terms of the, the three possibilities, which go much further than what my proposed amendment um, stated. My reason for doing that is to try and stop people from coming in into what is now the Wild West. You're hamstrung. You, can't, you can only do what you're given in terms of the bylaw as it's currently dealt with. And so my concern, stated again, is what's our timeline for moving this forward? I don't want to see any more of these RV parking lots crop up along the path of trail. And how long is this going to take? Are we going to sit on this? Are we going to... And, and we're not you, Mr. Bray. I'm not saying you're sitting on this. We need to move it forward because anybody can come forward and put in you know, another 139. Right. So we're, we're, we are we are very aware of the urgency of it. So we're we are moving this forward. We want to meet as a committee again. So timelines. Yes. So if tonight, or this afternoon, it's not tonight yet. If this afternoon we, um, you know, I got very clear direction. This is what I, we needed to do. We would we would take it to planning advisory committee. Council has to give it first reading. They set a public hearing date, probably in the community. Last time we had it in the community. Yeah. So you're looking at uh, another three months for the uh, for me to make a change if I knew what we were doing right now, right? Is it so, a possibility to put a stay um, until? Yeah. So it is possible. It is a possibility to do a stay. Yeah, and we've done that. So in in Antigonish County, the town of Antigonish just brought in a lodging home bylaw, 
that's basically stopped new student ho housing in the town of Annie Mitch. So of course it immediately bled over into the into the county, and and they were permitted. Same thing, you got a zoning bylaw, and, and they were group home boarding homes were permitted in the zone, and all of a sudden you've got whole cul-de-sacs being converted to student housing. It makes the national news because the RCMP are finding people and they're getting evicted or whatever you get out of university. And, um, so we put a stay in place. We were immediately, we, our first thing we did was remove the possibility of there being any more uh, boarding homes. But that's still the same process. So that came, that was the decision that this committee said, let's, as an interim measure, say campgrounds are not permitted, make that recommendation because it's, a rec it's an advisory committee, then we would go to, to council and council would make a decision whether or not they, they want to do that. The first reading, that's a very quick amendment for them it's done. So what's their timeline for that? Well, it goes to let's say that the committee says, "Yeah, we'd like to stop further development." So the timing is so, so we're so what are we now? It's, we're in October, so you hit November. Have your council been sworn in? Yeah, <coughs> yeah, we, we're having uh, November first to swear in the, 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 the new council. Yeah, that's right, and then the meeting should be about two or three days after. Yeah, so I would hit. I would. I would be able to hit the first. I would. I'd hit the first council meeting. I'd hit the first council meeting after the council sworn in. So beginning of November, December public hearing. But 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 as soon as council as soon as council makes the motion and gives it first reading, and I put an ad in the newspaper saying that. Council is going to have a public hearing and give consideration to no more campgrounds. That first ad basically puts a stay on it. Well, it's the same thing that we were talking about doing with my proposed bylaw uh, amendment. If that had been put into place, it would have been moratorium until the Yeah, until I still need to go through process. Yes. I mean, I appreciate your. This lady back here in the middle. So I understand this whole uh, meeting is about the Shetikan area, and you did say that there was a three-year plan to review the whole uh, municipality for zoning. But I am wondering if in this iteration of the revising of the zoning law, could the coastline from Pleasant Bay all the way to Marbury <coughs> Harbor be included in, in that? Even though we don't belong to uh, to Shetty I, I mean, no, well, no. Why? Be, well, because for well, I'd love to do, it. but the people in Marbury Harbor have no idea that this meeting's happening, right? I mean, you. No, you, you I'm, have I'm to, actually to the bridge, so through that boat, and uh, we have. So, uh, so I guess the best I can do here is take that under advisement, make sure that's reflected, and we can have a conversation about that as, a, as what, what options are available to the municipality. Mr. Bates, you mentioned that you've given the municipalities have three years with which to come up with a plan. So I guess my question is to Alfred and to the other councilors here. Um, are you hearing that there's a concern here in the municipality, not only in Shetty Camp, but also in San Josef and Land and Kaplan Land, all the way up to Bell Pope? Do you not see this as an issue that might be dealt with on a more speedy level at the at the county level? I, I, I definitely agree with you, and uh, I mean that's what I was saying. It's all about control, you know, and. Uh, 
and to know exactly where we're going and to know what the people are feeling, you know, the, the feeling of the people, you know, and to make sure that we have some kind of uh, general information between the people that wants to come in and do some businesses plus the residents, plus the seniors, plus the different people that we have around Chetka, you know, and Pleasant Bay and Nico. You know, Talkins for St. Louis of the Wind, we have our councillor Laurie Cranton there, you know, that, you know, I think the brook is at your place, Chloe, it's the division there, so at the other end, I don't know if I, we would take a, a, a line off for this group here, you know, for Shenkat, and then at the other end, could uh, this gentleman go next to uh, Claude e, across the river from him, and then put a trailer uh, coin? Yeah, I, I, I don't want a piece of the land. Oh, yeah, yeah, but can I just ask a question? How many people here don't want another campground in our community? Yes. Are we at capacity for what? Because when you look at Shetty Camp, it's not very big, huh? There's not much land. Yeah, we have Shetty Camp Island, and it's empty, and it's government, and it's whatever. But if you look at our community, it's not very big. You blink and you're gone. Right. So the consensus here, we might be at capacity. We have four campgrounds uh, sat, uh, on the island, the two new ones, the one, we have five, and we consider the national park. So I think, I think personally, we're at capacity when it comes to campgrounds. Because all the restaurants are full. Anyway, there's, there's certain econ economic um, uh, studies you can look the impact. You can't just say there's no more housing. And I agree with you. Um, trailers are going to be more popular now because of COVID. Because people are traveling with their families. They're renting RVs. They're, they're driving around for the next couple of years. And I agree. Um, but I think for land capacity, unless you throw in Chevy Camp Island, in the, we're at capacity. There's no more space. Uh, to me, I could be completely off, unless you want to build into the, into the highlands, into the mountains. I don't see, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're at capacity when it comes to campgrounds in our community. That's just me. So I get the, the feeling here that nobody wants more campgrounds, correct? Just correct. No, there's But the show of hands, there's like 95% of the show of hands that we're at capacity. Just, I'm just talking about capacity when it comes to land. Correct me if I'm wrong. And capacity when it comes to, I mean, if you, if you create 110 beds, 100, and, anyway, if you count how many in, in total, there's, I don't know, I think we're pretty, uh, anyway, that's just my idea. I just want to get the feedback from everyone. Just to, but we don't know that. Yes, what, exactly. We don't know that. That what? That we're at capacity. That we're at capacity or not. We don't know that. I don't know. Well, it depends if we talk to. Well, it depends if we talk to our restaurant owner. I, I'm, I'm emotionally you with you, Tony, but yeah. we don't know yeah. that. It's true. Okay, uh, this lady here, I don't think I've heard you yet. Um, my intervention is going to be short. I think you know we can look at area miles, but some of us like our free space. And even though you have a hundred square foot, it doesn't mean you have to put something on it. I agree. So the thing is, is that I'm all for business. You know, I, I'm all for business. However, there's some businesses that fit better in certain places than others. Help planning, yeah. Yeah, I'd just like to answer the earlier question there a little bit about the coastline and expanding whatever bylaws up through um, towards Marguerite. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I was invited here today because I'm getting a lot of good information and and I've al I always learn and take from that. Um, but when you leave Shetty Camp and go up the coastline, I think there's various other communities that would need to weigh in on this as well. And uh, so I think that's very important just as you wouldn't want those communities he's telling Shetty Camp how they have to do their business either. So I think there's a balance has to happen there and the results may be the same, they may not. Um, there's different landscapes um, that may or may not have the same, the same uh, uses and uh, I think that's for the people in those communities to, 
to sit down like you're doing here today and work out a process that will allow them to make those important decisions as well. I'm just wondering if, like, I, I agree on with Jolene's point on the limited land that we have in the zone area of Chetty Camp. I also agree with you on we don't know that. You know, we would have to have this initial report done on that. But uh, I'm just wondering if there's any way of looking at it throughout the municipality. Does it have to be in a planned zone? Can any can any law be considered um, to have to go through one of these options? Does it have to be in the, in the plan zone? Like if you're going to open or develop a, a, a business on a, on a plot of land, you're going to need a building permit of some sort. Sure. So why not have to go through a development agreement in any, okay, any so part of the county? So the development agreement is tied directly to a municipal planning strategy and land use. So I don't, I don't, re so one of the things that would happen, perhaps, if you just said no more uh, RV parks, period, campgrounds in this zoned area, is that exactly the same thing that happened in Andrew Nish and in County, it would, it, St. Joseph Des Moines is the next place we're going, right? Because there's nothing south. So well, that's, that, that's my point. San Jose Des Moines is not zoned, so why can that not just be considered so, so the, the option that the other option that the municipality has, which is what we're working on, is a um, there's there's two real bylaws that the municipality can have with respect to land use control. One is a licensing bylaw, and one is a land use bylaw. So if we brought in, and we're looking at both Inverness and Victoria County because there were rumors that you know. John and Mary McDonald were coming back from Fort McMurray and doing a, I don't know, 500 site RV park on Bulletry. And uh, we heard about it pretty quick. The same thing, right? I, I should never have got a degree in planning. I should have got a degree in reacting. <laughs> but, um, but the, um, so we're looking at doing a licensing bylaw. So the licensing bylaw, cannot control land like a land use bylaw can, but it can put in requirements before that they would need to get an annual license. And to get your license, you'd have to meet the requirements. So can it, you can't use a licensing bylaw to do something that you're supposed to do through a zoning bylaw. So there's no way of going through like a public hearing. So I couldn't prevent, not, not for a licensing bylaw. I could, but I could put requirements in so that to get your licensing bylaw, you need to, I don't know, do A, B, and C, and show that A, B, and C are still in place, and then we'll renew your license, right? Um, there, there's, a, there's a bureaucracy that goes with that, though. But we are looking at that as another option. But what you're saying, why can't I do a development agreement for the rest of the municipality? The only way I can do that is through a, a document which is what the province is telling us to do. Right? Sorry, one more. We, oh, sorry. Can we, could you do a moratorium on any more uh, campsite until you have a plan, a zoning plan for that kind of development for, for, the, for the municipality? I mean, those are grandfathered in. And after that, it's not going to work. Yeah, so I'd have, to, uh, I, I'm, I'd have to give some thought to that. Because what the municipality does have with, is they have a, um, a wind turbine. So they have a municipal planning strategy and land use file, and it covers the whole of the municipality. It's not, strictly speaking, a planning document, because the only thing it does is um, prohibits um, wind turbines and controls uh, utility size or controls utility size the way it does something with wind turbines so um, so i might you might be able to put something in that document but i don't it's not an easy thing just to to do that so uh, could we it's feasible because of that document but I, I don't know. 
I don't, I don't know how politically acceptable it would be. I don't know. So, so the answer to that question is yes, maybe, I don't know. This lady in the back. Is it possible to look at density of these proposed campgrounds? Like, you know, some, some of the ones that are really problematic with a, a lot of noise factor is that they, they're far too close together. And they cause yeah, exactly. So that is something that we could do so in the zone. That should just be say that reasonably easy to do is deal with density. Yeah, but that's and that's something that we would have liked to have been able to do, to say, you know, you're, you're only permitted um, so many per square, feet. per square meter, whatever, so many. Um, but yeah, that's an option. Again, like you, like those dozen in front are basically well spaced apart. They're not, where the other one, they're, they're literally boom, 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 boom. boom. To give you more specific numbers for that, one of them was, and I'm not going to name the names, but the, the two extremes were one was 20,000 square feet per unit, the other was about 2,000 square feet per unit. So that is something that in this report we did view as well. Let us let you know that it's, it is something that we are looking at. I just got a couple of few summary comments, you know, from my perspective, just how my brain works, very, very simple. And I applaud all the concerns and we try to address all, however, there's always that fine balance. Uh, three or four years ago, I got a little tourism in Nova Scotia prior to uh, wanting to develop, and there's this uh, thing called Navigator. A lot of the questions that were posed here today were the questions that I had as well. There's this entity that's called a Navigator. What they'll do is they'll put you in the right direction with the experts on all the RV campground questions that you will have. I definitely recommend that to the audience concerned. And the other point um, that the, they spoke about was to minimize bureaucracy. With bureaucracy, you have, you, you need resources, you need a lot of staff. Therefore, they, the uh, the B&Bs were, were rising, and the RV parks were actually on a decline. And that's based on a report from 2015, and I have the references uh, that I can share with you. So they spoke about the licensing, and there was no added value. It was a, a duplication of effort, where anything to do with the environment was addressed with the environment, the noise, if it gets noisy, you got the RCMPs. I've met with uh, you know, Constable Yannick, a very good individual. I spoke to him about that. What is our options? If it does get out of control, as, a, as an owner, if I have a couple of rowdy RVers, he said, just give me a call. So there are protocols in place currently as um, you know, just a business owner. And the other part is, um, I always have that same question. Is Shed Camp open for business? You know, with the climate um, change that's going on with COVID and the challenges that we have, you know, as current business user, uh, users, what are we going to do as a global committee? Are we going to close shops? So option four, are we completely closing that door? Or are we going to do like an impact assessment to see if really the demand that is on the rise, if we're going to global, uh, take a piece of that or just going to let go of the door? Yeah, but, but do you live here? I've been here for 12 years. Do you live here year round? I would love to live here. But and I, the other and the other can't go the same thing. So Does he live here? I'm working at Angle. He's moving. He's moving here. And the thing is, we live here. We live here year round. I chose to, to, to grow my family here, and we're going to live here. And the, owner, the owner of the other campground is from He's from this region, correct. and he went away to work, right. and then he got enough money to come back and start a business. So yeah. how is that can't hold that. No, but I'm just yeah, telling yeah, you what uh, Betty Ann said. I'm just going to say yeah. what Betty Ann said. There's a place for everything, and there's yeah. a place for different businesses. Shadyfax is a tourist region. It is. But there's a location. But, but it should be right on, right on the highway where there's very limited amount of highway for traffic going by the direction. To have trailers pulling into your property is going to be awkward. There are not, there's not a single tree on that property. Oh, sorry. I mean, that's that's property. Property. oh sorry, okay. But the property that we're looking at, that's questionable, there's a matter of location. And when you have a proper location for a campsite, that's one thing. But what we're saying is that we don't want them in this area on the highway where they're visible, where they're camped in, and where they look like a parking lot. And that's yeah. not our yeah, idea. Yeah. 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 You have all these 
these government departments experts that do all that analysis. And they don't live here. here. They don't live here. And that's yeah, what they, I'm trying to say. Know. So, so they, they, they can't they all the I think I mean, no way. Like, I'm looking at it from a business perspective. Yeah. You're so, you're so wonderful. You're yeah. trying to incorporate well, well you. you've been uh, told that before. You don't have to. I think the one question that are, uh, uh, more, most yeah. people are mostly concerned about is not yours. It's not yours. And I realize that. So thank you for that. So you don't have to defend that one as well. I'm more of a right. like I was telling you know the key stakeholders. I'm community focused, right? Yes. And that's that well, we everybody here appreciates that, that, but you don't have to defend the other that that that's, that's his job, right? right? And for us here, as community uh, business owners, we're to try to make his position and his decisions more balanced, not totally skewed to one. Right. Okay. Or so, uh, so I, I, I think we. Maybe if this, we, we've been an hour and a half, or heading, actually we're 10 minutes short of two hours. Can I just get your, um, and, and unless there's, oh, I've got three. Okay. <laughs> so we'll go you, you, and you, and then we'll, and then wrap up. I think I've got. Yeah. We do want business to come in, but it has to have response. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I sold a home in Toronto and moved here. Choose to move here because it has an environment of peace, of calm, of clean air, a uh, little noise, didn't have uh, parking issues like downtown Toronto did. Uh, we want business to come in, but it's got to be responsible business. It's got to respect the fact that people want their privacy, they want quiet, calm, clean air. Um, after, after, our, yeah, after our CMP is called, the damage is kind of done because everyone's awake from that party next door. Yeah. So it's like you're trying to mitigate that so you can make a living with your business and we can enjoy our peace and clean air. That's okay, so... It doesn't have to be either. Yeah, Absolutely. So who, is, who had... Uh, Um, something when you talk about uh, research and stuff, uh, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an engineer, but I live here, I have moved away, now I'm back. Uh, I don't need somebody from elsewhere, I'm sorry, to tell me it's me. And, and you have uh, your true, and they're well anchored there, your, your, your true uh, RVs. These are going to be coming back and forth. And it's interesting, last week, they posted windy area in Pond Cross. I, I want to do a test. I, I know the answer. The picture tape there, there it's going to be windy. The trees are not going to grow. Rana and I love trees and we're planting trees. We've planted thousands of them. There's no trees that, that, that will ever grow there. Nobody asked. We live here. We know. So this gentleman here in the middle. Um, just one more I'm sorry, I don't know the name. Vic. Vic. Vic Lawson. Vic, you seem to be portraying this choice as either closing Shady Camp to business or opening up. Oh, well, we're just talking about option four. Option like and four, that part of the business. Okay. Okay. But what I think most people here, if I'm hearing correctly, what we're interested in is finding balance. So that it's good for everybody. Well. Yep, exactly. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Yes. So, you didn't put your hand up before, but you didn't say anything at all, so I could do that. Yeah, uh, my name is Jean Chesson. I'm uh, born and raised here. I went away for many years. They first pay off my school loans and then uh, established myself in a career. Came back in 87 as the first executive director of the old Shadigan Development Commission. That's what brought me home. And one of my first responsibilities was to sit on the very first advisory committee formed to put together the document that we're now discussing. It was with the skillful help of Dave Keefe, a senior planner with municipal affairs. I just want to say a couple of things that I think are important. I think the initial reason 
or an intent that we got together in those days was to finally come together and establish a set of rules, a bit of planning to give us a little control. At that time, we were contesting vigorously the idea of you know, our situation in our county and how uh, and, and how much of taxes we were paying relative to the services we were getting. Uh, at that time, there was a dynamic type of participation in the community. And you know, at times, a bit of a rivalry between cooperators of the movement and the free enterprisers, you know, the other end. But things were moving, moving along. And, uh, but again, the intent was to gain a little control and establish some rules for development so that we may live in peace. We've always been very welcoming of everybody from every part of the world. But we do try to maintain a bit of ourselves and maintain a bit of our cultural heritage in the process. And land use is part of that. So here we are, 30 years later. I'm still here. John Bay is still here. And we've got some really smart and cute looking people here. And thank you all. I mean, you are all super skilled. You're bringing in all kinds of assets, intelligence and everything. And this situation with the campgrounds has, uh, is compelling us to come together. And maybe that's what we need the most in our community. It's coming together. And together peacefully resolved. And in doing so, we have to accept the fact that we're all going to have to compromise a little bit. That's the rule of humankind. That's how we do peaceful coexistence and progress. I've had a business in town. I established a business as I come away. I came back and uh, raised my kids. And here we are, trying to revitalize an economic development council. Uh, we're recruiting all kinds of talent, you know, that's coming back. That's coming for the first time. So, as uh, as a citizen of this beautiful area of Cape Breton, I would all like you to, to think about compromising and coming together and supporting uh, our decision makers, supporting the fact that we have, as we realize it, I mean, we're slow in executing things, getting things through the system, kind of clogged down by red tape. So we need to build efficiency, and to that, with that, we need public support to that first level of government and to those institutions we put together. So, thank you for having listened to me. So, um, that's the end of the agenda. I think that the conversation would be very helpful. I, I think we've got some direction on that. Um, I think the next item on the agenda really is to uh, set a date for our next meeting. Um,
Um, there's less conflict. Yeah, so we don't. Or we do, we don't. We don't. That's what I'm hearing from the committee, so I, I'd like to, uh, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, I'm going to go away and write something. We have to show of hands to see which option most of the people here agree on. So you could move forward and try to implement that one. Okay, so the first uh, thing that I was hearing was, um, but, okay, with this caveat that this is not a democracy, it's not, I'm not, you know, I, I, it will be it will be helpful for me to get the sense you want to see direction. Yeah. Where you should go. Yeah. yeah. So it, it will have, and the one that the, where where I want to get um, direction from is from the committee, yeah. right? So just so maybe I should ask the committee. Do you think that would be helpful to get that kind of a, a show of hands, or are you clear on what you would like me to do already? I am. Uh, I'm clear on what. The committee, what the oh, what the oh, audience, what the audience has. Yeah, well, we've listened almost two we're, hours. We're so. pretty clear on, okay. on yeah. that. And what option would that? Um, what option are you planning to implement or thinking of implementing? Okay, so the first option that I'm looking to the committee for is that short-term removal of campgrounds from the RR want the rural. Okay. As, a, as an immediate, try to get that to council as quickly as possible. That's what I'm hearing. Yes, I don't know if that's what the committee wants me to that's do. That's first day, you mean? Sorry? Is that first day? Or just yeah, yeah, no, it's, 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 it, it, yeah, but once it's done, it's done, right? Yeah. So, but then there would be the commitment to come back to this committee with, with other options. Now, you might, the committee might say at that time, well, we're happy with the interim measurement be, measure being a permanent measure. Whatever. But I'm, not, I'm absolutely hearing we don't want another one to happen like the ones that have. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> that's what I'm hearing. Yes. No, that's right. So that's, that's... That's one point. And then the second one, but once that happens, then the second one gives you a lot more, that gives you more room to, to maneuver. 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 But again, all this committee is doing is recommending. So I would take that recommendation to to planning advisor. Do we have a planning advisor committee established? So, so do we didn't we didn't have to reappoint that committee. All right. Okay. Good. Good. So I go to PAC and then the council, and we would the council would say, well, no, we're not going to do the interim measure. We could, right? but that's the direction I'm getting to at least put that proposal to them. And then the second one would be to come back, I think, with a tourist commercial zone that people could apply for through a rezoning process. So that second phase, I would, I would come back to the committee and that would have to be much more fleshed out, right? Yeah. What do you want to see in the zone? What kind of densities are you talking about in the zone? That kind of stuff. This gentleman here. So. Um, this is all about the campgrounds uh, that we're talking about here, but there are other problems. Um, will this affect these, or do we have to do this whole process again with, for an example, the helicopter and the uh, you know, potential of okay, so other businesses? Other businesses coming in. Because yeah. these, these uh, suggestions will have an effect on other businesses, right? Yeah, so all we are dealing with campgrounds. is campgrounds. That's yeah. all we're dealing with yeah. in this, this thing. So, so again, um, if there are other things, but this, so we'll I think this committee is all of a sudden going to be a busier committee than it was. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. But I think, but with respect to helicopters, that's federal jurisdiction, right? I, municipalities have absolutely no jurisdiction on helicopters. Mm -hmm. okay. Landing them, um, um, like we just don't have jurisdiction, it's a federal jurisdiction. The uh, crown jewel in the deck we tried to uh, regulate him. In fact, if he's building something on his landing strip, the National Building Code doesn't apply to the, um, the like municipal regulations do not apply to uh, aviation. So, um, so I don't think I can do anything about helicopters. 
I myself am a contractor. I deal with a lot of building permit issues and development permits all the time. The thing is with campgrounds right now, there's no set rules for it. So I think if we do decide to make a tourism zone, that would be our best decision. And then that here we can discuss that with the public to see exactly what the people want in the area and then take it from there. So we have, I'll interject on that. There are some current rules and it's all regulated by the province. And the province yeah. I do not move forward unless the environment tells me to go. But you are you are in a unique situation because of that wetland, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm talking about wastewater. Like, the first thing that you do when you get a campground, you have to get a wastewater permit. Of course. The same so thing I, I, have, I have to do the same thing with, with new homes. Exactly. Yeah. Right. You do not move forward unless you get that permit from the environment. But right now, there's nothing stopping you from opening a campground like next door to some people, not yours, but the other one. Well, there is basically just a parking lot that we're trying to avoid other others from starting. So they obviously have an environment uh, permit for their holding tanks. And then they obviously have a permit from the municipality to develop their land with these two scale meeting the, the simulation guidelines. But really and I think the community is saying that's not enough. Yeah. Yes. It's too I mean, that's what the community is saying. That's why it's all. Because he's got his environment approval, he's got our municipal approval, and he's got 150 sites. Yeah, I think the capacity. Right, so that's the that's the that's the that's 150 that's washers of that. And that's that's the part from the environment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no way he can he, he can't touch that out every two days. There's no way. He signed that agreement. He has to. Yeah, he has to. Yeah. So so why don't yeah, so there's a lot he has to. But like we well, have to not rob a bank too, right? Anyway, I think I think so. I've got pretty clear direction. As a committee, generally. Agreed that that's my direction. Put something together for the municipality to, as an interim measure, so, remove campgrounds from the zone. The impact on those, so we'll have a quick uh, memo. And that you don't want to come back to this committee. I would just run that, run with that. Right. But I'll have a memo to council so they're clear on what that, the implications of that are. And then, secondly, work on a tourism commercial zone and how somebody would get that and bring that report back to this committee. So, but I mean that's that's probably less of a less of a imperative soon if I get the first one. As long as you protect us from other things. I've got one question. Like, we know that the Arctic Council have a 
140 armies skiing in the ocean and throwing trash in the ocean. So whatever is done tonight, I hope it will stop any new business to happen like Brandon and like that. Uh, the same people, the experts you mentioned today, are also the same people who just allow the factory to burn tires in Sydney. So I'm all for business development, but like I had said before, I'm not for any business making money at any, any price. We have to be able to say, no, we don't want that in the future. It should not even start. They should not even start to dig anything. Because now that kind of ground we're talking tonight, it's late. It's a done deal. So are you saying all businesses, all new businesses, not just campgrounds, you want to stop all no. new businesses? No. No. I don't want to stop. No, no. I don't want to stop all no, new businesses. No, no, that's not what I'm doing. If I build a house, I need to follow us of, of saying to build a house legally. Right, when you make a campground, there's way the... less things to follow. Any business can start, like, I, I just feel now it's too permissive. You can start anything, anyhow, quickly, and then deal with the consequences after. Right. So, so the so so general is. point that you're making, specific to what we're doing, is, is dealing with the campground issue to address exactly what you're saying. But I think your point is there are others. So, yeah. But that's not the purpose of this committee. Yeah, it's, it's not only campgrounds. Mr. Chairman, Stefan, to answer your the question, I said that uh, any business, any personal people that goes into business, they're going there for money. I didn't go there. I didn't say that I would like to have a business where sewer is going all over. A business to be operating under the guidelines of the provincial and uh, federal or municipal agreement and it has to be controlled and that's that's the thing i was not saying that you know with uh, you know anybody can come in and do whatever they want with no uh, but they know, can now not... but they can now that's the thing oh yeah oh yeah well, that's... that's why we're here okay but, but uh, yeah but i think i think that again the general point is well, apart from campgrounds, I and mean, the point's already made, we do have some controls that are out of balance. But the purpose of this committee this afternoon is simply to deal with campgrounds. So I've got my direction, and I think there's no other... Uh, and, and so I, the next meeting date is less of a, of a crucial point. I don't think we need to decide that now because I've got fairly clear direction to go to council with. And um, when we put together a staff report, we'll get in touch with the committee and we'll uh, advertise. So this is, these meetings are always public meetings. Um, we put it on our Facebook page. Okay. Oh, we did? We did? Okay. We, did. we can. Yeah. Did we? Did we? Not, not the decision. How did everybody? Is that a process question? You sure. mentioned that you will be placing an ad like in the ORAN or something it's in the when it's going to council. Um, what assurance do we have that council will approve the recommendation? Alfred, do you want to address that? Like, or, or is that a process? Well, uh, I tell you what, we'll be looking at uh, the proposal and the bylaw. Will there be some and discussion? And it will be discussed with the group, Eastern Planning. You will have a presenter presentation and everything right. and that's how it has been done sometimes we accept it sometimes we don't sometimes we uh, but most of the time we do accept okay. you know unless there is something that uh, you know in this world but in most cases if the community and i mean the community not only a handful here like the, you know, we're going to have a public hearing. Yeah. That doesn't mean that if we get a public hearing with 50, 100 people, that we might have a different, uh, different you hearing. know. My decision would be depending, and I said it before, on what will come in on my desk at the, at the last minute, and then I will make a decision. So are you saying there will be a public hearing before council votes? Yeah, there has, there, there, has to, there has to be. So basically what will happen... It will be here too. Oh, sorry, John. No. Yeah, yeah, no, no, there has to be a public hearing, yeah. It's so, Shedekin. Yeah, why did you tell me Shedekin? Yeah. We're going to make sure we get into the... Okay, now, with this public hearing, say, once you have it, 
Is it going to be a show of hands who accepts what the proposal? No, no, it's a, because the, now council. the responsibility is council's, right? So usually what happens is, so from this meeting, I'm going to do a, a quick memo. It'll go on to, to uh, Planning Advisory Committee right. and Committee of, and Council for first reading. Right. Once they give it count, once council gives it first reading, what they do is they set a public hearing date. Okay. And so they set the public hearing date, mm -hmm. and I put an ad in the paper, it's got to be at least 14 days ahead of time before the public hearing, and it's just got to be two. So I'll put those two ads in the order. The first ad acts as a, a moratorium. I can't issue permits that are contrary to the, um, what council is, is advertising to consider. Right? So once that ad goes in, basically there's a stop for 150 days. 150 days gives us enough time to finish the process. Then we have the public hearing. I'll make a presentation to council as to uh, the amendments we're looking for with a recommendation from myself, or not myself, but from the planning department, district planning, as well as a rec recommendation from this committee, because I think I've got the recommendation from the committee. Well, I'll just get the committee. So that's what council has. They have a recommendation in favor of the amendment from staff. They've got a recommendation in favor of it from the local committee. Um, and then, yeah. They'll ask whoever wants to speak in favor of the amendments. Okay. And they'll take names. Yes. And they'll only let those people speak and they'll only let them speak once. Okay. Then, they'll, then they'll say uh, who wants to speak opposed to the motion. And they'll take names and they'll only let them speak once. So you don't get the first guy talking and then the second guy rebutting and then the first guy rebutting and the first guy. Would you, everybody opposed? Or in favor, and everybody the opposite. Okay. They'll then close the public hearing because they've heard the public, and they will either make a decision that night to to amend it, or they will table it to the next meeting of council. Okay. And if they table it to the next meeting of council, usually it's because something's been raised in the public presentation that they want me to re get back to them on. Mm -hmm. Right, so. But then at the next meeting of council, only the councillors who were present at the public hearing are able to vote. Okay. So then they vote on it, and if, if it passes, then it's probably pan and bylaw amendment, so then it goes to the minister, and the minister approves it. And then I put another ad in the paper saying it's got ministerial approval, and it's now in effect. And all of that should happen within the 150 days. But the main thing from your concern, is that first ad, yes. for my concern, uh, but is my, that? My, well, my question was, once you have the plan formulated, do we get to see it before we can uh, talk about things you do? We're yeah, talking about two different things. The amendment that I'm talking about that's going right to council is going to go to the policy that establishes the rural residential zone yes. and pull out campgrounds. Then it's going to go into the land use bylaw and where the list of permitted uses are in the, the zone, it's going to pull out campgrounds. Okay. That's the short-term interim measure. Yeah. It just makes them not permitted in that zone anymore. Mm -hmm. Then the second thing that you're talking about, we're coming back to this committee mm -hmm. to discuss all of that. Right. And that's public. And that's public. Yeah, all our meetings are public. Mm -hmm. We can only meet in, in camera if we're dealing with things that this committee... What I'm trying to say, during public hearings, can you, are we going to be able to see what you're planning and then be able to rebut or talk about what we don't agree with? Yeah, okay, so, so when, for the second option, where we write a staff report, if I write a staff report and we do this new tourist commercial zone yes. and everybody hates it, yes. and we say, well, too bad, we're going to council anyway, right? We go to council, which is hyper, is very, very, very technical. <laughs> you know, when we go to council, then they're going to say anybody who's opposed, and you're going to talk to a, talk to council about that time. It's ridiculous. He ignored everything we said. Yeah. We told him we didn't like it, and he said he was going to do it anyway, right? So that's your opportunity to come to council and, and speak opposed to it. And then the other line is going to be really short because nobody's going to be in favor of it, right? So, 
then council makes a decision. Well, a full council chambers. Okay. Just, Can we make something very clear both to the public and to everyone here that you've done your job and you've gone to the environmental agency and gotten their permission to use certain things? And we've ascertained that there will be a, a reaction and a response to complaints. And then they'll, any concerns will be mitigated. Can we make a clarification between that and having an actual environmental impact assessment done? Yeah, they're two, di yeah, they're two different talking things. To yeah. the public or so, well, those are all the things that we would be dealing with with respect to this new zone and how we can get the new, the new zone. Yeah. Um, so I'm just looking to the committee. I need to. I I, I do need something from the committee, um, and it can be by consensus, or you can make a motion that you are by consensus you're in favor of me with that immediate um, interim measure, writing that to go to council, which is removing campgrounds from both the plan and the bylaw. I'll make the motion. So is that by motion or by consensus? I'll make the motion. Uh, okay. So motion. So, motion by Lucille, Lucille seconded by Kevin Camus, that as an interim measure, you're, we're recommending to council that campgrounds be removed from the zone. All those in favor? It's unanimous. So that's, that's, that's helpful. And then the other motion, I don't need a motion because I think I, I, I do have consensus and I'm coming back with that other proposal. The other motion I need is to adjourn. Motion. Good. Done. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can write to us at cetne.television at gmail.com. Thanks for watching.